like to welcome this morning Dwight Kroll. Dwight is uh, taking courses in Kingswood and Acadia and I'm not conservative. Um, and I believe he's going to the University of Toronto in the fall and possibly be part of uh, our pastor's daughter and her husband, David and Olivia's church family. So welcome, Dwight. For, uh, as was said, as though for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dwight Kroll. I uh, grew up uh, around here in Woods Harbor but uh, I spent a lot of time on the island at Andy Swim's house when I was younger, shooting hockey pucks in their basement. I'm sure they remember that. Um, and I went to Kingswood University uh, with Olivia, the pastor's daughter, and um, I just finished uh, a master's of classics at Dalhousie University where I met my fiance, and we're gonna be getting married uh, next July. I'm going to the University of Toronto in September, so the move from Woods Harbor to Toronto is going to be a bit of a tough one. Um, but I think uh, being in Halifax is kind of a stepping stone to help me handle that. And uh, hopefully at, when I'm done at University of Toronto, I'm taking my PhD there, and the goal is to uh, become a professor. Um, but as was said, I have a training in New Testament studies, and uh, I've been speaking some this summer, and um, I'm happy to be here and uh, share a message with you this morning. Um, I want to focus on the Gospel of John. Um, if you would like, you can turn to John 1, chap uh, John 1 verse 9 with me, um, where we will pick out the theme of what I want to speak about this morning. Um, in each one of the Gospels, um, there's <coughs> each of the Gospels declares their main theme and the opening at the beginning. And one way to consider these themes is answers to the question of who is Jesus. All the Gospel writers are trying to give us an answer to that question. This morning, I want to consider what the Gospel of John has to say about who Jesus is. And to consider Jesus' identity, we will follow a theme that John announces in John 1, verse 9 to 12. If you're there, you can read along with me. John 1, verse 9 to 12. The, the Apostle John writes, There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So Jesus came to his own, namely the Jewish people. However, some of his own did not receive him, although others did receive him. But what were the Jewish people receiving or not receiving about Jesus? In John, they are receiving or not receiving Jesus depending on what they believe about Jesus' identity. And this morning, I want to explore who Jesus is, and we'll explore this according to this outline. First, we will consider the basic claim that the Apostle John makes about who Jesus is. That is clear to us. We can get to that on the surface of the gospel. Secondly, we will look at two scenes in which the Jews reject Jesus and slander him. And finally, we, we will consider how John demonstrates or proves who he says that Jesus is. So let us begin by considering the purpose of the Gospel of John and how John achieves that purpose. Identifying this purpose allows us to answer what it was about Jesus' identity that the Jews disagreed about. And two passages in particular help us identify uh, John's purpose and this controversy over Jesus' identity. So if you would like, you can turn with me to John 10, verse 24 to 25. John 10, verse 24 to 25. I'll be jumping around from the old uh, in the book, Gospel of John quite a bit during the sermon, um, but I'll give you time to follow along if you'd like, and this could be good practice for the sword drill next time you do it. John 10, verse 24 to 25, it reads, The Jews then gathered around Jesus and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify about me. So the purpose of John's gospel is to bring forward those signs or works that testify to Jesus, and more specifically, testify that Jesus is the Christ, which means the Messiah. Near the end of the gospel of John, in John 20, verse 30 to 31, and I'll read it to you, you don't have to turn there, <coughs> 
John 20, verse 30 to 31, John writes, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So it is clear that the Jews disagreed over whether Jesus was the Messiah. It was this question, is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, that divided the Jewish people? Now, who is the Messiah? What did Messiah mean? Messiah is a Hebrew word that, that literally means anointed one, and Christ is the Greek translation, which the New Testament is written in, of that word Messiah. So Jesus Christ means Jesus the anointed one. In the Old Testament, kings and priests were anointed for their offices. And so in that sense, they were, there were many messiahs because they were all anointed. However, the Jews came to expect one kingly messiah in particular. And this is how the expectation came about. When David was made king, God made an everlasting covenant with him as recorded in 2 Samuel 7. In this covenant, God promised David that someone from among his descendants would always be the king of Israel. However, as we know from books, the books of 1 and 2 Kings, many of the later kings of Israel were wicked, and in the end, God ended up handing over Jerusalem to foreign nations, and the Davidic line of kings were, was broken. The later prophets, looking back at these events, so Isaiah, Micah, etc., were in wonder since they perceived a contradiction. God promised that there would always be a Davidic king in Israel, and God can't lie. But now there is no Davidic king, so how can this be? It seems that God perhaps is lied or doesn't have the power to come through on his promises. So the prophets began to prophesy that God would, in the future, raise up an anointed one, a Messiah, who was the descendant of David's broken line. This is where the, the phrase, the stump or the root of Jesse comes from in the Old Testament and who would, this Messiah would restore the kingdom of Israel. This is who the Messiah is, and John in his gospel is arguing that Jesus is this Messiah, which is a very controversial question to the Jews in the first century. And even now, many of the Jews don't believe the Messiah has come yet, and they're always pointing out new Messiahs. So, it is John's purpose in his gospel to argue that Jesus is the Messiah. How does jo John achieve this purpose? It appears from these two quoted passages above that John appeals to Jesus' signs as proof that he is the Messiah. So we need to ask, what were these signs that John used as proof that Jesus is the Messiah? Again, there appears to be a fairly straightforward answer to this question. The first half of the Gospel of John, chapters 1 to 12, have been known as the Book of Signs, and there are seven signs in particular that Jesus performs, and I'll outline them for you. The first sign, of course, is turning the water into wine in John 2, uh, in Cana, and this happens in Cana of Galilee. John ends the account writing, this deed at Cana in Galilee is the first of the signs by which Jesus revealed his glory and led his disciples to believe in him. The second sign is when Jesus heals a nobleman's son in chapter 4. After the first sign of turning the water into wine, Jesus heals a royal official's son, who is at the point of death in Capernaum. John ends this story in a similar way to the first, writing, this was now the second sign which Jesus performed after coming down from Judea to Galilee. The third sign is Jesus healing, of the, healing a lame man. After Jesus performed his second sign, he travels to Jerusalem for a festival. And at Bethsaida, sick people who were blind, lame, and paralyzed were there, and Jesus heals a man who was crippled for 38 years. The fourth sign is the familiar feeding of the 5,000 in John 6. Sometime later, Jesus returns to Galilee and feeds the 5,000. John again calls this a sign. The fifth sign is when Jesus walked on water. After Jesus performed the feeding of the 5,000, he walks on water over to Capernaum. The sixth sign, and very um, surprisingly, is Jesus healing the man born blind. It's said in the story that nothing like this has ever occurred before. No one has heard that someone has healed a man born blind. And shortly thereafter, Jesus travels um, back to Galilee and then to Jerusalem again, where he performs the seventh sign, which is raising Lazarus from the dead. The final sign splits the crowds in respect to their opinion concerning who Jesus is. And John writes, Now many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him 
But some of them went off to the Pharisees and reported what he had done. And of course, the Pharisees plot to kill Jesus. So it appears then that John points to these seven signs that I outlined as proof that Jesus is the Messiah. At this point, however, a not so obvious question arises in which the question I think is very interesting, which is how do these seven signs show that Jesus is the Messiah? In other words, why would the Jewish people believe that Jesus is the Messiah when they saw him perform these signs? There were many miracle workers running around performing many different miracles. Why weren't they the Messiah? Why were these signs in specific showing that Jesus is the Messiah? I will suggest an answer to this question at the end of the sermon. However, for now, we will follow the outline as set out at the beginning and move on to considering two examples in the Gospel of John in which the Jewish people reject Jesus, some ex- received, some rejected, and they, the ones who reject him, reject him as Messiah, and they slander him. So if you would like, we'll consider two instances in which this occurs, and if you would like, you can turn with me to John 8, verse 37. John 8, verse 37 to 42. John 8, verse 47 to 42. The passage reads like this. They answered and said to him, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. Then they said to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if you were If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. The question is, how do the Jews slander Jesus in this passage? Notice that when the Jews respond to Jesus in verse 41, they begin with, we are not born of fornication. And this causes Jesus to say in verse 42, you do not love me. Why does Jesus think the Jews do not love him when they are defending themselves by saying we are not born of fornication? I think that when the Jews say we are not born of fornication, they are not actually defending themselves, as one might think, but they are slandering Jesus. They are saying, no, you are born of fornication, and that's why we don't love you. They are, in other words, they are labeling Jesus an illegitimate child. Thus, Jesus responds with the words to the effect of you do not love me. Now, it may seem strange to us that one would accuse Jesus of being an illegitimate child, one born outside of marriage. However, we must remember that when Jesus was alive, it was not a secret that Joseph denied being his father. So one had two choices concerning what to believe about Jesus. Jesus is either born from the Holy Spirit, as people claim, or he is an illegitimate child born of fornication. In other words, Mary was unfaithful to Joseph. Since these Jews are rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, then they surely would deny that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Thus, they conclude that he is born of fornication. An illegitimate child lost certain Jewish rights, and being an illegitimate child carried a large stigma. Some rabbis, for instance, believed that an illegitimate child and that child's descendants, if they had any, did not have a share in Israel's final redemption. For this reason, to call someone an illegitimate child, and we know the stronger word for that, constituted one of the worst insults to a man in Jewish culture. Anyone using this insult, in fact, was sentenced to 39 lashes with the whip. This potential punishment explains why the Jews who are insulting Jesus say indirectly, we are not born of fornication, rather than directly saying it to Jesus. This accusation against Jesus, the Jews who rejected him made, seems to have become a standard accusation to make for those Jews who would later reject Jesus in the coming centuries and is still made today against Jesus. In a text titled The Gospel of Nicodemus, which was written sometime between the second and fourth centuries, the author records a scene in which the Jewish leaders are accusing Jesus to Pilate. The Jews, speaking directly to Jesus, say, what shall we say to you? First, that you were born of fornication. Second, that your birth in Bethlehem was the cause of the slaying of children. Remember Herod killing the 200 
uh, all children under two years old. Third, that your father Joseph and your mother Mary fled into Egypt because they had no confidence before the people because he was born out of Woodlock. Annas and Caiaphas said to Pilate, our whole multitude cries out and we are not believed that he was born of fornication. The tradition among the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Christ became that Mary committed idolatry with a Roman soldier named Panther. So this is the first way that the Jews rejected Jesus. If they reject him as illegitimate and he can't have a share in Israel's redemption, how can he be the Messiah which ushers in the kingdom of God? Let us consider a second instance in which the Jewish people did not receive Jesus but rejected him. This instance occurs when the Jews choose Barabbas over Jesus during Jesus' trial before Pilate. After Pilate has flogged Jesus, he brings Jesus out in front of the Jews and says to the Jewish people, Behold your king. John writes that in response to this, the Jews cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answers, We have no king but Caesar. This denial of Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah becomes quite ironic in light of the, a scene in John 18, verse 39 to 40. And if you would like, you could turn there with me. John 18, verse 39 to 40. This is the release of Barabbas. So, in John 18, 39 to 40, John writes that Pilate says, But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but release Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Here is the irony. Barabbas, in Aramaic, means son of the father. So the Jewish leaders reject the true son of the father, Jesus, which Jesus has been calling himself throughout his entire ministry, for a false son of the father, Barabbas. The irony abounds even further. Notice that John adds the detail that Barabbas was a robber. Now, in the Gospels of Luke and Mark, they say that Barabbas was an insurrectionist and a murderer, but they do not mention that he is a robber. So why does John soften the charge against Barabbas from insurrectionist and murderer and simply point out that Barabbas was a thief? Perhaps the answer lies earlier in John 10. In this chapter, we're familiar with Jesus' figure of speech in which he compares Israel to a flock of sheep and himself to a good shepherd. However, in this analogy, the opposite of the good shepherd is the thief. Jesus says that the thief, in this, I think we're all familiar with this sentence, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. John is saying that the Jews, by rejecting the true son of the father, who is the good shepherd, have accepted the thief Barabbas. In other words, the Jews have chosen a fate of destruction and death by rejecting the good shepherd. shepherd. And why is this ironic? Well, it is ironic because John tells us the very purpose that the Jews hoped to achieve by killing Jesus was that the Romans would not take away both their place, which is Jerusalem and the temple, and their nation. But by killing Jesus and accepting the thief Barabbas, the false son of the father, the exact opposite of the end they attempted to achieve by killing Jesus occurred. In the other Gospels, in fact, Jesus predicts that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed because the Jews rejected him. And indeed, Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans. The temple was destroyed, and the Jews were expelled from living in Jerusalem in 70 AD, roughly 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, and the Jews only got back to Israel in the early 20th century. So to recap, the Jews reject Jesus by slandering him as an illegitimate child, one of the worst insults in Jewish culture. The Jews reject B Jesus by directly denying he is their king and in turn accept a false son of the father Barabbas, who represents the thief in the condemnation of Jerusalem. Now let us continue forward by considering how the Jewish people um, actually accepted Jesus and what they believed about his identity. Throughout his gospel, the Apostle John brings forth three main witnesses to Jesus' identity. The first is John the Baptist. The Baptist testifies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and when he is asked who he himself is, he denies that he is the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet. And we'll come back to this prophet figure shortly. 
John the Baptist's testimony, testimony is very important for the Apostle John's purpose in writing his gospel, not least because some of the Baptist's disciples in the later centuries began to teach that, he, that John the Baptist was the Messiah. However, for the sake of time, we must pass over John the Baptist's testimony to focus on the testimonies of two others. The second witness to Jesus as the Christ is Moses. In John 5, 45 to 47, and this is a very important passage. If you would like to turn there, I'll give you a moment. John 5, verse 45 to 47 is where we see that Moses testifies about Christ. In John 5, 45 to 47. After Jesus heals the man who was ill for 38 years that we mentioned earlier, and before he feeds the 5,000, Jesus says to the Jews who were persecuting him in John 5, 45, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So where in Moses' writings, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, did Moses write about Jesus? Well, I think that the Jews' response to Jesus feeding the 5,000, which happens right after Jesus makes this statement that Moses wrote about me, helps to answer this question. In John 6, um, this sign causes the pe people to proclaim, sorry, in John 6, 14, if you just flip there quickly, um, the sign of feeding the 5,000 causes the people to proclaim, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. If you remember earlier, John the Baptist denied being this prophet figure. It appears then that the Jewish people expected not only prophets from time to time, but the prophet, a unique and superlative prophet. prophet. Where did this expectation come from? I think it is no accident that the Apostle John has Jesus say in John 5 that Moses wrote about me, and then immediately after record a sign that causes the people to wonder whether Jesus is the prophet. For indeed Moses, in Deuteronomy 18, foretold that a prophet like himself would come into the world, and this prophet was to have at least four distinct characteristics. And again, I'm practicing you up for the sword drill here, but if you would like, you can turn to Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 to 22, and this is an essential passage in the Old Testament for understanding the whole Gospel of John. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. This is where Moses writes about Jesus in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 22. And there's, he write, Moses writes about this prophet figure and points out four characteristics that the prophet will have, and I'll highlight them as we read through the passage together. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 to 22. It reads like this. The Lord your God will ri raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. So they're talking about they're at the foot of Mount Sinai in this passage where the Israelites said that. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. And this is the first characteristic of the prophet. The Lord says, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. So the prophet will be like Moses. And the second characteristic, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And the third characteristic, it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. In other words, he will be judged. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And here comes the fourth characteristic of the prophet. Well, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. So if the Lord has spoken something, it will come true. So in other words, Jesus' word as the prophet will come true. The prophet has spoke, this prophet, prophet has spoken presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. A prophet who speaks and does, his word does not come true. So, the prophet whom Moses foretold in this passage became a focus of Jewish hope in the first century. 
The Jewish people looked forward to the coming of this prophet, and so it was call, pro, proper to call him the prophet rather than a prophet. The Apostle John is very concerned with showing that Jesus is indeed the prophet whom Moses foretold. And throughout his gospel, John shows how Jesus fulfills these four characteristics that I pointed out that the prophet is expected to possess. For the sake of time, however, we will only briefly consider two of these characteristics. The first one is that God will put his words in the prophet's mouth, and the prophet will speak all that God commands him. And the second is the prophet will be like Moses. Many times throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is recorded, re recorded referring to the first characteristic, that God will put words in his mouth and he will speak all that God commands him. Jesus is constantly referring to this, that he is doing this in the Gospel of John. One particular instance is instructive, though. During a controversy with the Jews in John 8, 25 to 27, the Jews asked Jesus, who are you, directly? And listen to how Jesus responds. In John 8, 25 to 27, he responds, he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. I speak these, these things as the Father taught me. Now, you might be wondering that Jesus is dodging their question. You ask, who are you, and you come up, Jesus says this, it might seem incomprehensible. You're not telling me who you are at all. But if we know that the, the prophet is supposed to hear the words of God and speak them to the people, we see that Jesus is indirectly answering their question, I am the prophet, because this was a very distinct characteristic that the prophet was supposed to have. Secondly, let us consider the second characteristic that Jesus must possess as the prophet, namely that he must be like Moses. How does John show Jesus is like Moses? There are two instances, in fact, where John shows this, but we will just look at one. In Exodus 16, Moses provided quail, which is meat, and manna, bread, for the Israelites to eat, and they ate this for 40 years. Jesus, in John 6, as we have seen, also provides food for those who followed him out into the wilderness, the fish and the loaves of bread. So once the Israelites see this sign that Jesus, in fact, has performed, what does it cause them to declare in verse 14? This is truly the prophet. So here we have an answer to why the feeding of the 5,000 would cause people to say Jesus is the prophet. The prophet is the prophet like Moses, and Moses miraculously provided meat and bread to the Israelites in the wilderness when they were hungry, and Jesus has done the same for his disciples. Thus, Moses wrote about Jesus when Moses foretold the coming of the prophet. John goes to great lengths in his gospel to show how Jesus fulfills each of these characteristics of the prophet. He will hear from God and speak those words. God will judge whoever does not listen to his words. What he predicts will come true, and he is like Moses. This is all throughout the gospel of John, if you know to look for it. Yet, if John's purpose in recording the signs that Jesus performed as we said earlier, including the feeding of the 5,000, is to show that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, then why does John include a sign that seems to show that Jesus is the prophet? How does including such a sign further John's purpose for writing the gospel? Without going into any details, I can just say that the, um, the answer is the Jewish people in Jesus' era identified the prophet with the Messiah. So for John, these two figures are the same. Now that we have considered Moses' testimony to Jesus' identity, let us move on to the most, and final, the most important and final witness that we will consider to Jesus' identity. While referring to John the Baptist, Jesus mentions God as another witness to his identity. In John 5, 34 to 37, John chapter 5, verse 34 to 37, if you would like to turn there, Jesus says, But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. John, referring to John the Baptist, was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony that John has given me. For the works, his signs, which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, these testify about me, that the Father has sent me, and the Father who sent me, he has testified about me. The signs that Jesus performed 
specifically the seven we outlined at the beginning of the sermon, are God's way of testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. But the question I said we would come back to, and that I want to consider now is, how do the signs that Jesus performed in the Gospel of John demonstrate that he is the Messiah? In other words, why does John include these signs to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and not other signs? John leaves out the virgin birth. John leaves out the transfiguration and many other signs from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why does he choose these signs in specific to show that Jesus is the Messiah? So let us begin with the book of Isaiah. And I will just quote two passages quickly from Isaiah. You don't need to turn there if you don't want to. It was a common belief that the Messiah would be recognized by the signs he performed, in fact. And these signs became known as the footsteps of the Messiah. A list of the signs the Messiah would perform are recorded in Isaiah 35, verse 5 to 6, and Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2. And I'll read both of these passages at you. Isaiah uh, 35, 5 to 6 reads, They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame, lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. For waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So the signs outlined there that are relevant for us is that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, and the, the lame will walk, and the mute will talk. Now, in Isaiah 61, 1-2, we see further signs that the Messiah was meant to perform. It reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release from darkness to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn. The relevant signs in this passage are that he will preach good news to the poor and proclaim liberty to the captives. So in the New Testament, in fact, in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, there is a story in which John the Baptist is in prison, and the Baptist sends some of his disciples to ask Jesus whether Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus responds by combining Isaiah 35 and 61 in Matthew 11, 2 to 6, and this is how Jesus responds to the question, are you the Messiah? He says, um, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In the passage, John res Jesus responds to the John the Baptist's question, are you the one who is, was to come, the Messiah, by pointing to the fact that he is performing the signs of the Messiah. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, I am the Messiah, as evidenced, evidenced by, the perf by me performing the signs of the Messiah. Now, it is very striking that Jesus' response to John the Baptist in Matthew is almost word for word the same as a passage about the signs which the Messiah would perform from a collection of writings called the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was written over a hundred years before Jesus lived. So these scrolls record the same signs that the Messiah is expected to perform as Jesus quotes. And let me quote a passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls for you. They write, The heavens and the earth will listen to his Messiah. He who liberates the captives, restores sight to the blind, straightens the lame. He will heal the wounded, raise the dead, and bring good news to the poor. This is almost verbatim what Jesus is saying in the book of Matthew that, to prove that he is the Messiah. So both Jesus' response and this fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls list a set of messianic expectations, a set of signs that the Jewish people thought Jesus would perform. The heavens and the earth will obey him. He will heal the wounded. He will make the lame walk. The blind will receive sight, and he will raise the dead. Now, I, want to, I contend that the Apostle John shows that Jesus is the Messiah by showing that Jesus completes the works or signs which correspond to the signs that the Jewish people expected the Messiah to perform in the lists that I just read. So Jesus first turns water into wine, the heavens and earth will obey him, heals the official son, heal the wounded, heals the lame man, the lame walk, the fourth sign in the Gospel of John, feeds the 5,000, 
that was a sign of the prophet, the, who was to be like Moses, who also is the Messiah. The fifth sign, walks on water. Again, heavens and earth will obey him. Sixth sign, heals the man born blind. The blind receives sight as a sign of the Messiah. And seven, raises Lazarus from the dead. And another sign of the Messiah was to raise the dead. Thus, the seven signs that John include in his gospel are chosen for a specific person, purpose. Each one of them is a sign that the Messiah was expected to perform. And this explains why John includes them to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Let me close by summarizing. John's purpose in writing the gospel, we saw, is to demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah, namely a descendant of David who will restore the kingdom of Israel and show that God is faithful to his promises. However, some Jewish people rejected that Jesus was the Messiah. Rather, they claimed he was an illegitimate child with no inheritance in the kingdom of Israel, and they chose Barabbas, a false son of the father, and a thief rather than Jesus, a choice which ultimately led to the destruction of Israel. However, some did receive Jesus as the Messiah, and through describing seven of Jesus' signs that the Messiah was expected to perform, John proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And so may we all come to accept Jesus as this Messiah. Amen.